Please remain standing for today's scripture lesson from the book of John. Listen for the word of God. Jesus appears to seven disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom he, Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And please be seated, and thank you so much, Ralph, for that wonderful reading of the gospel story this morning. And good morning, Christ Church friends and family. What a joy it is to be with each and every one of you today. Amen. This is a glorious day, the third Sunday of Easter. It's not just a day, it's a season, really, in the life of the church. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of our Lord. As we continue worship, a couple of really quick things. First of all, if you are worshiping with us as a guest today, we're so glad to have you with us, and we hope that you'll join us again very, very soon. We're glad to see you and meet with you. I also want to take just a, a brief personal privilege and acknowledge and welcome my mother and my sister, my dear mom and sister here today, Helen Bryant and Gail Souther. Let's give them a warm Christchurch welcome. Thank you. And if you talk to them after the service, don't believe a word they say about me. Okay, thank you. Let's join our hearts in prayer as we continue in worship. Loving God, we thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you that in the power of your great name and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have called us forth, you have called us to gather. And Lord, as we gather here today, we've already experienced your grace and your presence and as we continue in worship, Lord, and prepare in just a few minutes to come to your table, we pray that you would continue to speak your word to us, that your spirit would fall afresh on us, and that the words of my mouth would be pleasing in your sight, and the meditation of all of our hearts would be as well, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, 
Amen. Well, at the time, I happened to be the assistant night shift supervisor in a warehouse. And what that actually meant was that I checked the work of the, of the guys on the line, I routed trucks for delivery, and I kept 17 guys from killing each other on any given night. And I remember I'd caught up on all the orders, and I was up on the mezzanine, and I was kind of leaning against the rail, watching the guys work, just kind of catching my breath for a moment. And I was uh, reflecting on a conversation that I'd had with my boss, the owner of the company. And when I'd had the conversation, I was actually kind of excited about it. It was a conversation about a new opportunity within the company. It would have been more, more money. And again, I was excited at first, but as I was leaning against the rail in that moment, I wasn't excited at all. In fact, I felt kind of trapped by the mere, mere thought of taking another position within that company. And I had this sense of dread about it. And, and it made no sense to me in that moment because I was newly married, young family, and the thought of a new opportunity and, you know, more economic opportunity. Like I said, it should have excited me, but in that moment it just didn't excite me. And I began to think to myself, well, well then what's, what's up with this? I mean, I thought about someone else who was kind of high in the company, and I thought, well, someday if I, if I had that position, how would I, how would I feel? And, and the same answer, not, not good, not at peace. And then I, I thought about the president of that company. I thought, well, if I, if, what, if I was, what if I was that person? They get to do cool things, and they do really well, and they make a lot of money. How would I feel if I was that person? Not any better. And, and then I even had this thought, like, well, not that it would have ever happened, but, you know, what if, what if your name was on the building and your name was on those vans that run around and make all these deliveries? How would you feel then? And not any better. And I think that musing that I was doing with myself had kind of morphed into a prayer. Because to be honest with you, at that point in my life, I was taking a break from school. I wasn't sure what my next steps would be. I'd been wrestling with a call to ministry and resisting it with everything that I had. And I said a prayer at that moment. God, what, what do you want me to do? And it was in that moment that I heard it. And it wasn't an audible voice, but I heard it. And it was very clearly God's call for me to go into ministry. And that sense said something to me like, like this. Eric, you know what I'm calling you to do. Trust me and follow. And everything began to change in my life after that. Needless to say, my life was at a crossroads in that moment. You've been at crossroads in your life, right? I mean, it's not just someone who experiences a call into ordained ministry that comes to a crossroads in life. There are many ways in which we come to a crossroads in life. If you start a new job, you are kind of at a crossroads in life. When you uh, get, get married, you're at a crossroads in life. If you've experienced divorce and or remarriage, you've experienced a crossroads in life. When you face the death of a, of a loved one who is close to you, you face a crossroads in life. If you have a health crisis, if uh, you, uh, you have a, a, a health crisis, as you certainly are at a crossroads in life. If you face an addiction, all kinds of situations place us at that moment where we recognize, wow, I'm at a crossroads. And I mentioned that to you today and mentioned my crossroads years ago because as we look at the gospel lesson today, we see the disciples standing at something of a crossroads. And here's what I mean. They've been following Jesus for three years, They've been listening to what the man has been saying and the claims that he was making. And they knew who he was. Peter's the one that said it, but they all believed it. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And even though Jesus predicted it, even though he said that the son of man must go to Jerusalem, uh, be handed over to the chief priest and the scribes to die and the third day be raised from the dead. Even though he said that, even though he had mentioned it, it was a shock to them when it happened when they arrested Jesus, when he was put on trial, when he was hung up on that cross, and when he died. And now, thankfully, we know this through the benefit of hindsight, and they were experiencing that too, and we're beginning to understand that, that his death on the cross wasn't the end of the story, of course. They were confronted with an empty tomb. 
But it wasn't just an empty tomb that they were left wondering about and, and left in the mystery of that. Jesus had already appeared to them two times. He'd come into their midst as they were locked behind closed doors. Then he came again, mainly, it seems, to address Thomas and his doubts and to allow Thomas to examine his wounds. We remember that story most likely. And here he's coming to them again in this gospel narrative for the third time. But think about the crossroads that they're standing on here. They have just witnessed firsthand the event upon which the entire history of the cosmos hinges. That is a crossroads. They have to somehow decide what do they do in light of the resurrection. Because there's one thing about a crossroads. You have to make some kind of decision, right? You have to do something when you're at a crossroads. Even to not do something is to somehow make a decision when you're at a crossroads. And they make a decision. At least some of them make a decision along with Peter. And what is that decision? After this greatest event, again, in the history of the cosmos has happened, and they have had a ringside seat to experience every bit of it, what do they do? What decision do they make? What question do they ask, and how do they answer it? What should we do? What do we do next? The answer, I'm going fishing. That's what Peter said. Did you hear it? I'm going fishing. And then others said, we're going with you. Does that seem strange to you? after all that they had experienced, that they would go fishing. And in honesty, uh, Peter has received some, some criticism from theologians and historians throughout the, year, th- throughout the years. Sometimes harsh criticism, churchy words, harsh churchy words like um, apostasy has come up with this act of, of going fishing. I mean, he had just witnessed the resurrection. Jesus had just come to them, and, you know, as we gather here on this Sunday, though. I'm not willing to be critical of Peter and the disciples for going fishing that day. After all, if you've ever stood at a crossroads of life, isn't there just some times where we just need to take a moment and catch our breath? Maybe go somewhere and process it just for a minute? And, you know, Peter and the disciples were undoubtedly feeling that way after all that had happened. And in their defense, Jesus had not yet given them the great commission. He had not yet ascended to the Father. The Holy Spirit had not yet descended upon them at Pentecost, and the church was not yet born. So why couldn't they take a night and go fishing? (laughs) That's what they did. But this is where their story, in my opinion, joins our story, in that we're all somehow, as we live in light of the resurrection, as those who believe in Christ— that we stand in light of the resurrection and we're at that crossroads of what to do about it. What do we do next? What does our gone fishing moment look like? Because when you look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, particularly the resurrection of Jesus and what goes on forward, it really is an invitation to join Jesus, to rise with Jesus, to new life, to abundant life, to eternal life. And when we look at this passage, which is so beloved to many of us, it's very beloved to me, there are, are, are so many ways in which we can see that we, that we rise with Christ, more than I can count today. I'm, I'm only going to preach for about three hours uh, about this today. Um, actually, we'll keep it to one hour, okay? Some of you are still looking at me. I'm kidding. I'm not going to preach that long. But this text is so rich in what is happening, but it's also reflective of how rich our lives are as we spend them with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And when we think think about this passage, when we think about this crossroads that the disciples and all of us are on, a few things are for sure. We, if we're going to rise, first of all, we're going to rise with Christ, we got to go with Jesus. And while I'm not being critical of Peter and the disciples for going fishing, I love to go fishing. You don't have to pressure me to go fishing. Um... They were trying to return, undoubtedly, to something that was familiar, to something that was comfortable, something that was just normal, and they probably needed that in their heart to heal and to make sense of everything that had and was happening. But 
when you think about them going fishing, you know, all those events of the trial, the passion, the, the, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus had happened in, in Jerusalem. And for them to go fishing up to the Sea of Galilee, that required a trip. You know, they didn't just pile in a truck and drive for a half hour and then get in a boat and go fishing. They had to go walking for a few days to get back home to go fishing. And I get a sense when I, when I look at the text that while Jesus was still in their minds, in a sense, they went ahead of Jesus. They got a little bit ahead of Jesus. And we're told as they fished all night, as the dawn came and Jesus is standing there on the shoreline, that they had fished all night. And how much had they caught? Nothing. They'd caught nothing. A few years back, Hannah was home, my youngest daughter, on spring break from college. And while I'd taken Hannah fishing many times, I'd never taught her how to fly fish. I'm not very good at fly fishing, but I, I, I'm skilled enough to teach my daughter how to fly. You know, I could, I could at least know the basics, and I shared with her the basics. And uh, I found out that day uh, two things. First of all, Hannah's pretty good at fly fishing. <laughs> uh, she caught quite a few fish that day. And I also uh, discovered that I'm not that good because I didn't catch anything that day. Maybe you've had that experience of going fishing and catching nothing. It's disappointing. And it would have been disappointing for, by the way, Hannah's never let me live that down, by the way, that she caught all those fish and I, I didn't catch any. But they weren't just fishing for pleasure, of course, when they went fishing. They, they were fishermen. They were commercial fishermen. And imagine them fishing all night. And in some sense, it would, have been, it would have been a beautiful sight by torchlight on the side or the front of the boat trying to draw up the little fish so they could draw up the bigger fish quickly, cast the net before they get away. And they'd repeated that process and thrown a net hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times. And every single time throwing that net, and then pulling it back empty. Imagine the emptiness of that and the disappointment of that. When I think about rising with Christ, I think about when I get ahead of Jesus, my life in so many ways ends up like that, kind of empty. doesn't mean I'm not acting. It doesn't mean I'm not doing. It doesn't mean that I'm not trying. It just seems to be bereft of fruitfulness. If we're going to rise with Christ, we need to go with Jesus. If we're going to rise with Christ as we look at this passage, it, it seems that uh, we also, well, we need to obey Jesus. We need to obey. It's interesting, isn't it, that they're uh, coming along there and Jesus is, is appearing to them. They don't recognize him uh, yet. It's one of those cases that's a little un, unclear this time. The resurrected Jesus is, is not readily recognizable. That's happened before. It happened with Mary. It, it's, it's not uncommon as Jesus is resurrected. Is it because it's still a little dark? Is it because of the fog? They're 100 yards off. Is Jesus somehow not ready for them to recognize yet? But he asked them a question. Children, have you caught no fish or have you no fish? If you, if you go back and look at the, the language in which this story was originally remembered and, and written, the, 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 the way it's remembered today doesn't, in my, in my opinion, doesn't really adequately convey kind of the, the tone that Jesus was offering here. This is the, uh, the Eric Bryant translation, which is not scholarly reliable, okay, but it, it, it could be translated something like this. Hey, boys, you haven't caught anything, have you? you? You know, you got skunked, didn't you? He's kind of playing with them. It's almost like he's, he's making fun with them just a, a little bit in a good-natured way. And, of course, they reply, no. And that's when Jesus tells them, well, catch, cast your net on the right side of the boat. If Jesus tells them to cast their net on the right side of the boat, what, where were they casting it before then, you think? Maybe the left side of the boat? And... Um, I, I suppose that there's reasons why they were fishing off the left side of the boat. Maybe that's where they thought the fish were. Maybe that was part of their muscle memory. Maybe their dominant hand just kind of, and their stance kind of led them to cast off of the left side of the boat. Maybe there was rigging on the right side of the boat, and it would have been cumbersome for them to cast, even, even dangerous for them to cast on the right side of the boat. 
But there's a good chance when we hear that command, it's not just a simple command to change the sides of the boat. It would have very likely involved something that would have been a little uncomfortable for the disciples. You know, when we get used to doing something one way, it develops a mental and even a muscle memory, does it not? If you don't believe me, try brushing your teeth with your off hand tonight before you go to bed. Or the next time the electricity goes out in your house, even though you know the electricity has gone out, you're going to walk into a dark room and you're going to do exactly what I do every time that happens. You're going to flip the switch, right? Even though you know the light is not going to come on and it's because you're just used to it. The disciples were used to it. But Jesus said, cast on the right side of the boat. If we're going to rise with Jesus, we got to obey Christ. we got to obey Him. And that's what they did. And I have to tell you that throughout my lifetime, there are so many comforting things about my faith. There are so many comforting things about coming near to Jesus. But I also have to say that my life and my ministry experiences, while I get so much comfort from, from Christ, I feel like I'm always called to somehow cast on the other side of the boat, and it goes against muscle memory. <laughs> it goes against what I know, and it's awkward sometimes, and it's uncomfortable sometimes. Can you imagine uh, how uncomfortable it was for me? Uh, I was still fairly newly married, and while I'd been struggling and resisting with everything I had, a call to ministry, I hadn't really talked a lot about it with my wife. So I had to go home and talk to Kathy about, hey, guess what? We're going into the ministry. Why are you crying? Hey, what, what's up with... It seems like instantly I, I kind of went from, you know, this guy she'd married with a lot of potential to being a pastor's wife. Oh, my goodness. And uh, Kathy's been an amazing support and partner in ministry. But it was awkward for us, especially in those early years, to figure out how to do it together. I've already explained to you in those early years of my pastoral ministry when I, I gave an altar call, the, the, the worst altar call in the history of the church in the last 2,000 years, yet in the power of the Holy Spirit, somebody actually answered that call. When I went to launch a new faith community, my, my first day in that assignment, just kind of waking up to the fact that, okay, I guess I need to go into the office. Well, I, I don't have an office. Or, well, maybe I should go visit the sick in the hospital. <laughs> I don't have anybody in the hospital. Well, maybe I should sit down and write a sermon. I don't have anyone to preach to, even coming to you in the midst of a pandemic. You have your awkward things that you're called to as well. The good thing about this is what we see happening and developing in the gospel story today is that they kind of went against the grain and cast their nets on the other side of the boat. As awkward as that would have been, they obeyed, and there was abundance in their being obedient. And I think not only was that true in the life of the early disciples, that's true for us as well. I, I love how uh, they caught this huge uh, catch of fish. The net wasn't torn. There's a very exact number of fish in that net, but they, they, uh, they, they come to uh, the shore there, and Jesus is there with breakfast. He's around a charcoal fire. Peter, of course, couldn't wait. He puts his clothes on and then jumps in because we're told he was naked. That sounds a little backward, but he was fishing probably with very little clothes on because fishing was gross. Peter couldn't wait to get to Jesus. The other disciples figured it might be a good idea to bring the boat in with them. So everybody was kind of playing their proper role in this. But think about that charcoal fire. Jesus is has prepared that for, him, for them. He already has fish and, and bread. He invites them to bring some of their fish for that fire and for that breakfast as well. And what Peter must have been experiencing in that moment, because the last time he gathered around a charcoal fire was in Caiaphas's courtyard. And he was terrified because Jesus was being put on trial just inside the house there. And there were people who were recognizing him as an associate of this man who was about to be put to death. And that's when Peter, of course, denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times, and then caught Jesus' eye through the window. 
and he was devastated. That moment up to this moment where he gets to experience another charcoal fire with Jesus. And, and after this moment that we didn't read today in this gospel, uh, G- Peter is kind of redeemed in a conversation with Peter where he gets to affirm his love for Jesus and, and, and gets to uh, receive his, his mission, if you will, of where he's going to go forward. But as Jesus gathers them around that charcoal fire, they know who it is. It, th- Jesus just has a way of revealing himself when, he, when we come around him with one another and bread is broken, and fellowship is experienced, we recognize him in our midst. They didn't speak of it, but they must have been trading joyful glances and sly grins. They knew they were gathered around with the one whom they loved so much and who loved them so much, who had died but who was raised from the grave. And there they are, in that mess of fish, 153. How did they know? Because they counted them. Fishermen count. If you go fishing, you know how many fish you caught. You always count them. They counted them. And there's something metaphorical about that large catch of fish, that specific number of speaking to a kingdom reality that we live in now, that the church can hold us, that God's love in Jesus can hold us, all of us, Every single one of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we've come from, friends, if we want to rise with Christ, we need to gather around Jesus. We need to have breakfast with Jesus. We need to have meals with Jesus. We need to experience the means of grace with Jesus, like coming to worship, coming to the table being together in Christian community in small groups and Bible studies of, of prayer and, and, and fasting uh, of, uh, of good works in the name of Jesus, of giving generously. All of those things are a means of grace for us to show up where God promises to be and allow God to meet us in those places and to transform us by his amazing grace. So in conclusion, I, I, I want to bring us back to the crossroads because we're all at that crossroads. Because even though our times and our circumstances are all very different, of course, from Peter's and the disciples, we're still confronted with an empty tomb. We're still aware of a resurrected Jesus who shows up at unexpected times and in unexpected places and teaches us amazing things. And the question is, at that crossroads, what do we do? Where do we go? When I was in ministry in an urban setting in northern Kentucky, it was one of the most stressed zip codes of the state of Kentucky, and most of my ministry was outside of the church building. I would leave the church building. Sometimes I would go right because there was an overpass, and I would minister to some of the guys and gals underneath there, but more often than not, I would turn left I would come to the first intersection, and I would very often just pray, which direction should I go, right, left, or straight? And it seemed interesting to me that no matter which way I went, I would encounter somebody to be in ministry with. And then one day it dawned on me, friends, that I could go right, left, or straight. Not that it doesn't matter in life which direction we take, but in that case, it really didn't matter. I would encounter somebody, but one thing I could never do was to go backwards. Friends, when we're at the crossroads with Jesus and the resurrection, when we see he is risen, when we know that he is alive, we can never quite go back. No, let us go forward. Let us go forward to fulfill his command to love God and to love neighbor. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.